Local Government Day. Um, my name is Jared Sipley. I'm the Vice President for Legislative Affairs here for the ASCWU. Um, I would like to go around and have you guys please introduce yourself. Please include your name, your title, as well as why did you choose to be a public servant? So we will start over here. Whoops. I'm Mary Morgan, and I'm on Ellensburg City Council. I've been serving for five and a half years. Um, why did I decide to serve? Because I was asked if I would run. And um, I've run two campaigns in that five and a half years because I took a two-year position and then had to run a campaign almost back to back. So, And I discovered I really like doing public service. So it... And I run a, build, a real estate business full time, so. Thank you. My name is Nancy Lilquist. I too am an Ellensburg City Council member. Um, I've for 16 years, I think. Um, I I too was asked to run, and uh, I had always been interested in public policy issues. And it was at a time in my life where I was a stay-at-home mom and the prospect of having adult conversation was really appealing. <laughs> and so um, I ran, and uh, I've been doing it ever since. Hi, uh, my name is Rich Elliott. I'm with the Ellensburg City Council. I've been serving for eight years. Uh, this will be my ninth and, and last year on the City Council. I'm going to actually look for something on the hospital board. Um, <clears throat> why uh, public service, and particularly the city, uh, Council, um, I used to be an employee of the city of Ellensburg. I worked for 30 years for the fire department. And uh, when we separated from the city, I had the opportunity then to uh, work with the city. I'm very loyal to the city of Ellensburg and to the employees. And uh, part of what we do from the city council is to make sure that they receive um, reasonable expectations uh, from the community and that we find the resources for them to do their job. Um, so that's one perspective uh, from, uh, for me. So, Thank you. Uh, I'm State Representative Matt Manwiller, and so I represent the 13th District, which is where you are right now. That represents uh, all of Kittitas County and, of course, Ellensburg, and, but it also goes east towards Grant County and Lincoln County. And uh, I'm in my fifth year. Uh, my day job is that I teach political science here at Central Washington University. So. I, I guess to answer the second part of your question, why did I run? I think I think all teachers, uh, teachers or professors, um, want to ch change the world. I think that's why they go into the field. Um, that and the uh, great pay. But uh, you know, so uh, get running for political office was a way to take what we did in the classroom and bring it into the quote real world. And so I, uh, I was intrigued by by that. I'm State Representative Jerry Paulette, and I represent part of North and Northeast Seattle, Lake Forest Park, and Kenmore in the State House, and I'm Vice Chair of the Higher Education Committee. And uh, I ran for office because I was a parent activist on education and involved in higher education access issues and wanted to continue that work, I think, well put from uh, my fellow Matt and I are the higher ed caucus in the legislature. I teach in the School of Public Health at the University of Washington. Don't hold it against me that I'm a husky. Um, but to be able to make that into reality, uh, some of the practice that we teach is really important. Well, hello, I am State Representative Melanie Stambaugh, and I serve the 25th Legislative District, which is Puyallup and Fife area of Pierce County. And I am in my third year in the legislature, and I'm proudly the youngest member currently serving. And uh, so my pathway to politics is uh, slightly different. I actually knew in junior high that I wanted to go into public service because I paged down to the Capitol. You spend one week taking papers from one office to the next, and I fell in love with the work that was being done 
done. I knew that great impact was happening at the state capitol, and I thought, okay, one day I want to be part of that impact. Um, I was under the assumption, though, that you have your career, your family, and then you run for office. And so I was asked to run in 2014, and um, after surveying many community members, I decided that it was the time for me to step in. I own two businesses, downtown Sumner, so I'm a business owner, took that perspective, um, had been active in education, some dropout prevention, nonprofit organizations um, prior to and still am um, serving in office. and. Uh, proudly sit next to Jerry on the Higher Education Committee and uh, really enjoy the opportunity to bring a needed perspective as a young person not too many years out of college to the state legislature. Thank you. All right, so our next question that we're going to go to is, is for everyone. What does public service mean to you? And we'll start with Melia Stambaugh. Public service means uh, bringing diverse perspectives together to find an outcome that benefits the community. And uh, I have a distinct opportunity to be a, a voice for my community. I often think of my job as a conduit. You have these voices of your community and they get to go through to you and you get to bring their perspective to the discussion in the legislature. And um, it's difficult sometimes as a public servant to stay tapped into all of the different voices because there are so many diverse perspectives. Um, but that open communication stream is critical to be able to do a, a good job when you serve your community. Well, public service and what we all do is a calling. And if you wake up one morning or walk out of City Hall at night after, at 10 o'clock at night, probably when you finish some meetings and sometimes midnight when we finish legislative floor action. If you walk out of that building and don't think it's an honor and a responsibility to improve our constituents' lives and people of the state of Washington's lives, um, then you've been there too long. It's about being able to make a difference and putting aside what you want for a career or um, your self-interest, it's about what you can do, why you were motivated to run, and are you still able to try to do something to make everyone's lives better in the vision that you brought to the office in the first place? Well, I, I absolutely agree with what uh, Rosalind Plutt said about the, the sense of awe. And I've always said to myself, if I ever show up in the parking lot, look up at the rotunda and I'm not moved, then I won't run again. Uh, but I'll offer you a slightly different perspective of what I found public service to be that I didn't expect it to be. And you become very protective of your folks. Uh, if you're an older sibling, you probably can relate to that. But uh, you're in the legislature and I find myself, well, hey, I got to look out for Ellensburg. Those are, those are my folks, right? Uh, they deserve their share of the capital budget. As a professor, I find myself protecting higher Ed, like, hey, you can't do that to Central, or you can't do that to professors. They they have to be protected. Uh, a lot of times, it's for farmers, since I uh, represent a rural community. I'm like, whoa, whoa, you, you can't take away their water, or you can't take away their access to markets. And so you find yourself uh, over there kind of uh, playing defense to protect the people that you represent. And uh, that's not exactly what I expected I was going to be doing, but it's just something that kind of grows on you to, to make sure that the, the people who elected you and the people you represent uh, have a voice and that somebody's defending them and somebody's protecting them because there's a lot of people with different interests over there. And I'll take this down more to the local level and I guess um, <clears throat> my perspective from the city council is that um, our job is to balance uh, you know sort of the history of the community and what the community has always uh, striven to be or strove to be, I don't even know what the word is, um, uh, and, and keep that historical context, but also realize that the community is growing, the community is changing, and you know, every September we get a big group of uh, new residents in the community. Um, I approach this uh, from Central Washington University's perspective that, um, you know, Ellensburg and Central are synonymous and, and that we can never, you know, make a separation between the two. And, you know, even though you occasionally hear um, 
uh, you know, about, you know, sort of concerns like, you know, this doesn't fit real well or, you know, there are some negative impacts. I, I disagree. I think that, you know, it is a relationship that is, you know, almost entirely win-win. And, um, I, you know, I, my appeal to you guys uh, today is um, I'm not running again. Somebody needs to run in my place. So register to vote here and run. Okay. I, I think it's been said, uh, public service is about being actively engaged in your community. It's about um, using my time for the benefit of my community um, and sometimes putting the self-interest aside. Um, I think there's a lot of different ways to serve. Not all of them are elected. Um, it, you know, it seems like you're doing a public service if you coach a Little League Baseball team and and you're you know, it, it is a public service um, The kinds of stuff that the Rotary Club does uh, to raise money for parks and things in our community so but but for me personally being a public servant means I go to a lot of meetings and I um, I put time and effort into trying to understand a lot of different issues that wouldn't have never been on my radar if I hadn't been an elected official who had to vote on those kinds of things. So, thank you. Um, I came into this five and a half years ago, and I am not a young woman. I did not expect to be running for office. It was a shock to me, and. Um, I'd never run for anything in my whole life before, so I, I didn't even get what campaigning was at first, but in the process of doing the doorbelling I was told to do, I started meeting all kinds of people I hadn't met before and finding out about things they cared about, which sort of surprised me that I would go to somebody's door and knock and they would start talking about why are their dogs running loose? or what do we do about the park? Or what about the people that drive too fast? Or whatever it was. And pretty soon I found myself being exactly what she said down there at the end. Cheryl? Melanie. Melanie. That Melanie said, you find yourself being that conduit between the citizens and, and whatever board or council or state legislature you serve on. You're the person that translates that information up or down. And I, I never expected that, and I'm finding it to be probably the most interesting part, is that I get to meet a lot of people. I get to be involved in the decision-making process, but I also get to be involved in it. I tend to be one of those people who doesn't talk much in front of council, uh, at the council meetings, about I want this piece of legislature, I want this done. But I tend to work behind the scenes more. It's just my style. And so I tend to go more to somebody and say, what if we did da 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 da? And it's interesting because a lot of times you can achieve things that way. And um, I love being on council. I've really enjoyed serving. It's been a great pleasure to me. Thank you. All right, so this question will go to the city council. Even with the growing economy, college students are still struggling to find work in the city of Allensburg. Some students had to even travel to Yakima in order to find a job. What work has the city council done to ensure job opportunities for current and incoming students who are looking for a job today? So we're going to actually split these up, and this one's mine. So, um, <clears throat> so the, the second part of what I was going to say in terms of public service is it's about balance and um, you know you, uh, many of you may come from a more metropolitan area where there is a, a more significant concentration of economic activity and um, to, to understand you know what a community that you know has a recognized population around 20,000 realistically or closer to 30 in terms of how you guys are counted in the census um, and to understand, um, you know, some of the challenges, it's important to, you know, sort of see that side. And on the flip side, you know, our goal, I mean, everybody on the city council understands, you know, and, and they use this term fairly loosely, but we talk about, you know, family wage jobs and we talk about uh, the ability to attract people who want to live in the community. Because, you know, frankly, being a bedroom community for Seattle, which to some extent we have 
there, there's a segment of our population that does that, and it's, it's fine. Um, but that's not, uh, you know, what a lot of people move here for, to drive a couple hours of work to work either way or into the Yakima community. Yakima, you know, you're adding to the commute and, you know, you've, you've lost some of the value of living in a community like ours. So we understand that. The city itself, um, you know, if you were to poll the uh, uh, city employees, you know, all the different departments, uh, many of them came to school here. Uh, many of them didn't live here originally, didn't necessarily go to uh, get their early education here. Um, so we know that Central is, uh, you know, one of the, the primary uh, kind of feeder programs into the city staff. And I will tell you that I am, you know, to a person proud of the city staff. I mean, it is what makes Ellensburg work. Um, <clears throat> you know, the community's uh, important as well. but. Um, so we have internship programs. Uh, we do everything we can to uh, have those internship programs. Uh, when when we match up and we find you know uh, the right candidate, we try everything we can to develop those people and try to keep them in the community and get them into the city. But the reality is, is the city of Ellensburg you know has 140 employees, and that's you know an insignificant number when you talk about you know what you guys graduate um, out of your each year. So. It's a combination of you know government job opportunities, but also the private sector and encouraging the right uh, kinds of, of growth, um, you know, to the extent that we can. And so, you know, we know that there are a lot of people here who want to stay here. We know that uh, for some of you, it's about trying to help pay for your education, and that those opportunities are not what they might be, you know, around a larger campus or around a larger community. And you know, again, um, we're asking you to help us solve solve those issues. Um, you know, come to the meetings. You know, tell us what those suggestions are. Because if we hear a good idea, even though we, the, the seven of us on city council, may disagree about how to get there, if we hear a good idea, we all agree on what the outcome needs to be. And you guys might have the solutions. Thank you. All right. So this one's to the state representatives. Established in 1969, the Washington State Need Grant was established to help low-income family children to pursue college. It has served nearly 69,000 low-income students in the year 2015 and 16, investing more than $305 million towards recipients who were fortunate enough to receive such help. Unfortunately, there are still 24,000 unserved students who qualify for the award but do not receive any funds towards their education. What proactive step has the state legislature taken to increase the amount of funding for the state for students in need? <laughs> you guys can do rock, paper, scissors if you want. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll go high level and I'll, and I'll bring it into state need grant. Um, affordability for higher education is critical. And I know this from not only a policymaker standpoint, but um, I entered the University of Washington right at the, uh, the start of the recession. And so my tuition from my freshman year to my senior year increased 60%. And so I have a lot of peers that didn't get their degrees because it was too expensive or have since come out with more debt than they anticipated because they could not pay for the college. And that it doesn't just impact the student then when they're in college. It impacts them for the next 10 years. It impacts their ability to uh, buy a house, buy a car. I mean, it, it has ramifications that are very severe for young people. We as a state used to have a model where we funded um, more of state investment and less from a student and family perspective, and that's actually flipped. So when I entered the legislature in 2015, we had many work sessions on what does college affordability look like. Um, questions like how many hours should students work to be able to pay to go to school? What is an equitable amount? I'm trying to look at affordability from different uh, perspectives. And we did make a significant investment in reduced tuition uh, for all college students for the first time in over 30 years in 2015. Um, that's going to take an additional investment to continue that decrease this year, this budget year. But when you look at state need grant, I think it's very important that we uh, we look to increase the funding for the reason that you have people who are eligible. And right now we're picking and choosing out of those who are eligible who receives that benefit. Um, I don't 
don't think that should be our role to pick and choose who of the same eligibility requirements get that, that funding dollars um, because we know that impacts so many people's lives who do receive those state need grant, um, that grant funding. It is, however, from a budget perspective, very difficult, um, especially in a year where we're focusing significantly on K-12 invest investment because the courts have said we have to, we have a basic education obligation. So we are balancing many different pieces, um, but my heart's desire as a legislature is that we do not strap our higher education students with increased tuition load um, because I know personally what that feels like. Thank you. Just jump in. So this is the call to action. Um, right now, as you probably all know, we're in a special session because we don't have a state budget. And we will shut down the government uh, July 1st unless we have a state uh, budget. And the House has passed a budget that includes a freeze on tuition and includes a very big investment in expanding uh, the state need grant and the number of students who will get a state need grant. The Senate does not do either one. And if you want a tuition freeze, and if you want a state need grant uh, expansion, it is vital that you talk to legislators, and whether you're right here in this district, or where you may have lived previously, or you may be registered to vote, um, mobilize the Washington Student Association, because basically this is going to be decided in the next 30 days. And the negotiators are sitting there right now and going, what am I hearing? Mm, the wind isn't blowing for freezing tuition. I'm not hearing a demand for that. Where's the demand for state need grant to be expanded? It comes from all of you, and it doesn't come, unfortunately, from powerful business lobbyists with large lobbying budgets. So you've got to be the people mobilizing, and we're accessible as legislators. Um, you send an email and say there are four students or four alumni or two parents and two students who would like to have coffee next Saturday at Starbucks with one of us will be there. So now's the time to make your voice heard. And if you don't, we are likely to end up making investment as required by the court in expanding support for K-12 education. And then when you graduate from high school, we just cut it off. And that's unacceptable. You've got to have a pipeline of access that ensures that as we expand success in public school, we make sure that you have the opportunity to continue on with a certificate or a college degree, because that's what's needed to change the opportunities in your lives. Thank you. I'll let you go to the next question. I'll weigh in on the next one. Thank you. All right, the next question <clears throat> is for our city council. Um, with CWU's enrollment growing rapidly and, and steadily increase of the numbers of students of color and students from marginalized areas, what steps has the city of Ellensburg pursued in order to create a welcoming and more inclusive, environment, more inclusive community? That's my question of the group. I'm gonna try not to put my foot in my mouth. <laughs> Sometimes I can do it really good. Um, I've lived in Ellensburg 19 years. I um, moved here from the San Juan Islands. And when I moved here, I thought, oh gosh, I've ended up in another community that's not very diverse. And it, and it kind of disappointed me because one of the things I was looking for was a more diverse community. There has been a huge shift in this community in the time that I've lived here. I've really seen it change. I see, I look around the room here and I see a lot more people of color that I wouldn't have seen 19 years ago. That pleases me. And I, and I think the other thing that I've seen change in this community is, on the whole, at least from the constituents I deal with, I would say that there is a huge move afoot to be more inclusive of people of color and of diverse backgrounds. 
when, when the horrible things were put on car windshields and stuff like that, and that started, what, last summer, I, I have to tell you, it was a shock to me. I, I, didn't, I just didn't know there was that part in our community. And what really pleased me was how rapidly it blew up and how rapidly people in this community said, not here, not in my Kittitas County. And I, and I really see that being acted on daily in my community. And I'm, and I'm proud of Ellensburg, and I, I think we are trying, and I don't, as a city we are trying, we try to include people, we try to do active things. We made, we as a city council did one of the first um, proclamations that was done in the state to say not here you're not going to do this and we also do I mean we we sponsor things within the community we do the bite of the berg in the fall and and I've noticed that that within the businesses that I trade with I see a lot more diversity of the people coming in I think they feel comfortable I think they feel safe and that's important to me that people in my community feel safe and don't feel threatened. And quite honestly, if any of you feel unsafe in my community, I'd like to know it because I can help with that. Um, one of the commissions I serve on is KITCOM, which is our 911 service. And I've gotten to know a lot of the police. And as a result of that, I, I have a, I, you know, they'll listen to me if I come to them. So that's about all, right. all I can offer on it. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so our next question is to our state reps. All of you have voted in favor of House Bill 1433, which was to permanently decouple SNA fees from tuition. This is very critical to our student employment as well as to campus activities and campus events that our students and campus life relies on. Unfortunately, it was blocked through the uh, Senate Ways and Means Committee. And so, for advice, what advice would you give to our student leaders as well as future student leaders to ensure that one, the student's voice is heard through this touchy subject, and two, how can we expand, extend a hand with our fellow senators to ensure that one, these type of transparent bills are pushed through the Senate? Well, I'll start with this one. The public policy that you raised here is an excellent example of what we call the law of unintended consequences in Olympia, and I think in all government agencies. Um, you have a problem that you want to solve, and you pass a piece of legislation, and it solves that problem, but it creates one that you didn't anticipate. And so, as you brought up with your last question, a few years ago, one of the primary concerns that we were hearing from parents was the rise of college tuition. They're like, look, uh, you know, inflation is at three or four percent, but tuition is going up seven to nine to 14 percent. You've got to get tuition under control. And as both of the representatives to my right said, we listened. And we were one of the only states in the union that didn't just hold tuition flat. We went out and voted to cut tuition, right? Uh, and it was a five, 10, 15. We ratcheted it down over time. Um, the unintended consequence is that a lot of us didn't realize is that student fees were tied to tuition. So while we were lowering tuition, we were accidentally lowering all the fees that the student body could collect to pay for climbing walls and microphones and all the other things that you put in the student union, right? So here, my dad used to say, no good deed goes unpunished, right? Uh, so it took a while for you to mobilize and realize the impact and came to us and said, look, you know, we're our own independent body. Uh, we have student elections. Uh, we vote to our own fees. We're like, uh, you know, a mini little democracy. And so let us raise our own fees and get them ratified by the students so that we can pay for the programs that we want. And for most of us, we heard that from your student lobbyists. They came to visit us, as Representative Pillay said, and uh, uh, you made the case. Um, however, at the same time, you know, the Senate, uh, which was where the tuition cut started, that was kind of their baby. I think what they were hearing from you is we'd like to raise tuition back up. Right? They're like, no, 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 we spent a lot of political capital to cut your tuition, and you're coming to me and asking me to raise your tuition, and that's not what your parents want. And so, you know, in a, in a complicated public policy like that, where it seems like you're getting pulled in opposite directions, could you please help us lower tuition by raising our fees? 
it, it, you, have to, you have to really you know, work that issue. And uh, that's what I would encourage you to do is just continue to do what Representative Play said is have those meetings one on one and explain to the members of that committee that we actually want this and we appreciate you cutting tuition and we want you to keep that tuition cut, but we'd also like to have our own independent authority to raise our fees to pay for the programs that we want. Uh, I will add, so I'm actually the prime sponsor of that House Bill 1433, so I've seen it all the way through its process. And what is a uh, good thing to note is that this decoupling of the student fees and tuition has been done in the back of the budget. So even if the bill does not pass, I do believe it is the intent of the legislature that if they hold or uh, if they hold tuition, then the decoupling will occur. I really do believe that will happen. Um, the one element that I do encourage those that are here today to do is to contact the budget negotiators and the members of the higher education committees, uh, both in the House and the Senate. I've drafted up actually a letter to the budget writers as the prime sponsor of that bill to say, when you're considering this and you are lowering tuition, even if you don't pass this bill, be sure to decouple these in the budget because we do not want that unintended consequence of not being able to um, allocate resources that you see fit on your college campus. We don't want to take that ability away. And so I encourage you to contact your representatives, your senators, contact myself, and I can, my office can get you uh, a little email list that'll make it easy for you to, to send out. But make your voices heard because we can share that information with budget writers, but at the end of the day, hearing distinctly from specific students, um, especially in mass, that makes a difference. Thank you. All righty. All right, so going back to Mary Morgan, how she ended with the leaflets um, promoting KKK ideology in our community that's made our, um, our students from marginalized areas on campus and our, and our community members feel unsafe and unwelcome. How can students and community members help combat racism, as well as making Ellensburg and CWU more of a competitive place for underrepresented groups to live and work? So I've got this one. Uh, I represent the city council on the Not In Our Kitco um, board, which is um, uh, usually meets up here on campus. Um, and our first goal was was to say no. Like Mary said, we wanted the community to stand up and say, we don't agree with this terrible message on this flyer. And so the, the Peace March was organized where hundreds if not thousands, I, I forget the, it was, it was a huge group of people, something that we've not seen in Ellensburg before, came together and forcefully expressed the message that of peace and tolerance and um, anti-KKK stuff. Uh, and we've also kept that message um, visible with the signs that you see around town and posters and bags and pins and bracelets um, just for a continued visible message of that's, that's not what we stand for. Um, and, I, and I have to say it's not just um, Racist. It's all. I mean, we're we're working to combat um, discrimination on you know any number of of things. You know, skin color, religion, disability, um, sexual orientation, what whatever people are targeted for. Um, we want everyone to feel safe in Ellensburg. Uh, the second thing that we wanted to do was uh, promote understanding. So where where does this hate come from? And to that end, we had a forum and a, a lecture with Leisha Brooks from the Southern Law po Poverty Center um, to learn about the, the history of racism in our region and, and um, what's going on nationally um, and locally. And, uh, and we also learned as individuals um, and promoted through our Facebook page, the Not In Our Kit Co. Facebook page, um, what we can do if we witness someone who is being verbally assaulted um, because of whatever um, difference someone might perceive, um, learning how to intervene and stay safe. Uh, and we've also tried, as the Not In Our Kit Co. group, um, to encourage 
people to talk to each other and overcome the fear of the other, which is, seems to be the root of, of where this stuff comes from. I've also felt that in order to feel safe in Ellensburg, you have to know that the police are there to protect you. Um, the, what we hear nationally going on and what you may have experienced in your own community, I hope you don't bring that to Ellensburg. Um, our police force is well trained and, and as a city council this is, this is where we can do something. We can make sure that, that our police officers have the resources and training to do their job and that they get the message from the top that we're not going to tolerate any racism among our uh, rank and file police officers that, and if someone has an incident that it's investigated. And uh, so we've, you know, there is more transparency. I've, I've asked that um, in the police department's annual report, they start publishing um, the use of force statistics and internal investigations. What, you know, how many complaints are there and do they get investigated? And they do. Um, our police department is accredited, which is, um, I, th I think the statistics out of 300 and some police, office, police departments in the state of Washington, we're one of 60 that, that have gone through the process to review our policies and procedures and make sure that um, we're, uh, we have the highest accountability. Um, but I also would like you, like Mary, if you have, if you perceive that you have a problem with an officer, um, I would urge you to report it. Um, but I, I want to caution, there's, there's several different police departments in, there's the, the campus police and the city police and the uh, state patrol and um, sometimes it's confusing, you know, which officer it was, what department they belong to. Uh, but if you report it, yeah, and the county sheriff, if you report it, if it's an incident that was called into KITCOM, KITCOM can trace it and we can sort that out. So, um, I, but it is important. We can't fix a problem we don't know exists. So if, you know, there's an incident, you need to report it. Um, I do know also that the, um, there is an effort uh, among se several groups, including the Chamber of Commerce, to um, work with local businesses to encourage good customer service that, in, that includes uh, diversity training. Um, and you know, that, um, that's kind of a, an emerging thing. We don't have that in place yet, but, but it is, is something that, that folks are working on. Um, but I think in the big picture, we have to remember that, that there there's a constitutional right to free speech. And um, it's, it's sometimes the, the line between just kind of hurtful speech and, and hateful speech and crossing the line to illegal actions th that are based on hate, that it, it's, it's blurry and there's a, there's a gradient. So, um, and I wanna say, that there was one person who anonymously distributed some hateful literature and thousands of people came out and marched for peace. So you know, what are you gonna remember about what, what is Ellensburg about? I, I hope that, that it's the, the energy of those thousands of people and not the, the one person who spread fearful, fear in the community because, for whatever reason. So um, I'll, I'll leave it there because I think Thank you want to move on. <laughs> Thank you. All right, the state representatives. So a tuition that had a historic cut this past year by 15%, I believe. Um, there is a Senate bill that was passed last year as well from one of your guys' uh, co-workers, uh, Senator John Braun, who sponsored the bill. Can't remember what bill it was. But anyway, that gives each college the autonomy to raise tuition by 2.1%. And so the issue that students are having 
again, you know, you cut tuition, and then all of a sudden, it's the fear that's going on right now with the student body is that it's slowly creeping back up to where it is. And so, how would you, for one, combat that, or basically give advice to students on how to basically, you know, voice their concern again, voice your concerns as well to you as about that. Um, well, let me repeat again that taking action is really important right now. Um, so it's really easy to find out who your legislators are. The legislature has made it exceedingly easy to go online. You know, look on your phone, go to the legislative website, you'll say how to comment to your legislators, and you can send them a message right now. All of our phones should go off while we're up here. <laughs> um, saying, hold tuition level and give your personal experiences. I teach at the UW, I have students who are working two jobs, and you probably in this audience right now, well, let me ask, how many of you are working in addition to going to school? That is the story we need to hear and talk about what it means if tuition goes up. And um, secondly, how important is the state need grant to you or someone you know? Because right now, as Representative Stambaugh said, it's kind of a flip of a coin whether or not you get a st your state need grant um, or not. So it shouldn't be that way. As Representative Manuel also said, it should be something that when you're qualified, you should be able to get it. And so we need to hear right now from people that it is vital that we hold the line. Um, a one-time cut essentially meant that we went from having increased tuition more than any other state in the United States during the recession to having increased tuition um, more than something like 46 out of 50 states. Um, uh, we are still at the per pupil expenditure level way down in terms of our support of higher education in the state of Washington. We need to hear from you and it needs to happen now and we need you to support the Washington Students Association and your AS in making, getting that message out as well. So I, I find this question, question fascinating uh, for a variety of perspectives. So let me give you a little history. Four years ago, I was up here on this stage. I was a relatively new representative. The uh, CWU uh, student body was doing something exactly like this. And to a person, they all came up to the microphone and said, please do not cut tuition. Like, do not vote for the tuition cut. And I was, I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, I hear nothing but, you know, the cost of college is going up. We've got this bill, and every candidate for the CWU uh, student body said, don't do it. And I was like, well, why? And they're like, well, we don't want our programs cut. We don't want to lose our favorite professors to other institutions. We don't want to lose the second floor of the sub and all the programs they had stuff. So, you know, one of the things we did is we did cut tuition, but we did something we called backfilled it, right? For every dollar of tuition we took away, we just took a dollar out of the general revenue budget and, and replaced it, right? So your tuition went down, but the funding of the school did not, right? Uh, but then I'd also kind of go back to what uh, um, Councilman Elliott said about civics is about balance, right? Uh, Representative Play asked you, how many of you have a job? Uh, and you all raised your hand. Let me ask you another question. How many of you voted for the initiative to raise the minimum wage? Okay. Well, do you think that CWU has minimum wage employees? Well, this year... Uh, the Associated Students and all of, the, all of the six campuses came to us at the legislature and they said, we need $68 million. 
And I was like, well, why do you need $68 million? And they're like, well, we have to cover the costs of the minimum wage that we just voted for. And uh, given all the student employees who work in the dining and the dorms and all the other computer labs, we need $68 million. And they're like, well, do you want us to cut tuition now? And they're like, well, not really. You know, we don't have enough money to pay the minimum wage for $68 million. If you cut tuition, we're really in trouble. So we're like, okay, well, if we give you $68 million and we don't, cut, and we don't uh, let you raise tuition, where do we get that $68 million? And that's the tough part of what we do. Do I take it away from foster kids? Do I take it away from nursing homes? Do I take it away from environmental protection? Do I take it out of the pension plans for police officers and firefighters? So we live in a world of finite resources. Um, and so we have to find balance, right? What everybody wants versus what everybody has. And if it wasn't for that, this job would be really easy and fun. But it's the difficult times where you have more people who come to you with very legitimate needs and there are more hands out than you have money to fill them all. And I'd say that that really is the core of what sometimes civic government is in a democratic society. Thank you. All right. Melody, you got anything? Okay, awesome. Um, anyway, I'd like to open this up to the crowd. If any of the audience members have any questions to ask both state representatives and or council members. Okay. I have a plug to follow up for the economic piece because I was supposed to do this earlier. Um, there are a number of, uh, maybe they're entry level jobs in some ways, they're also family wage jobs. Um, in our community that uh, we have been struggling for years to fill. And uh, uh, Councilmember Morgan mentioned uh, the 911 Dispatch Center, uh, KITCOM, we're short people. Uh, we need qualified applicants. Um, and I know that Corrections is constantly looking for people. And <clears throat> I know that, you know, for some of you, those, those, the idea of working in maybe one or both of those uh, fields, you know, might not initially uh, appeal to you, but I also would, you know, challenge you to kind of look at it and look at it from the perspective that, you know, while there may be, you know, some stress or some negative connotation for, you know, some people working in those industries, there are also uh, places where you can make significant difference. Um, in a local community, you can gather a skill set that if you choose to move on to a different industry or a different community later, we would hope not. Um, those, are, those are jobs. We can't fill them. And these are not minimum wage jobs. Um, they're benefited positions. So something to look at. Thank you.